put a typo on it, so you'll have to forgive me. I can't believe there's a typo. And wait till you see what the typo is. <laughs> <laughs> Quiz. <laughs> <laughs> On the bottom of the first page, it says the Inner Bay Peace Project has four centers. <clears throat> one's in San Francisco, one's in Antioch, one's in Livermore, and one's in Pingrove. <laughs> <clears throat> if the people in Pingrove see that, they're going to kill me. It's Pingrove, <laughs> two words. <clears throat> Yeah, oops. <clears throat> Does anybody have something else? Do you need more? Well, I run them off by the thousands, so whenever I go on bike, I give people notes. <laughs> Um, funny thing is, I don't use the notes, so. <laughs> what about the back? Oh, get the back. Oh, I, I thought. Everybody have I never read my notes. <laughs> I just wanted to give them a, a little summation. Usually when I give notes, either I'm going to supplement what they say, summarize what they say, totally ignore what they say, or add to them. So we will visit them to a degree in terms of content and material. There are three persons I wanted to talk about today simply because they have become so legendary and so mythical that when you talk about these three persons, the last thing you're talking about is three egos or three people who would write an autobiography. <laughs> they would write a, if they were writing anything about themselves, it would be about the rest of us. And those three persons in history that have become legendary and also have become mythical, that is, their lifespan has moved way beyond the significance of the time in which they lived, so much so that they touched the time in which we live. Mm -hmm. And that's when something has mythical and legendary proportion, when it goes beyond the mere historical or the past. Those three persons are Confucius, the Buddha, and Jesus. Now, of course, these three persons have been kidnapped by religious institutions. So that in the modern period, these three periods, these three people have become religious spokespeople. And therefore, they've been manipulated by institutional ways of thinking. You see it in the United States today, when there's a whole group of people who have literally kidnapped Jesus and made him a spokesperson of hate. And many mainline Christians do nothing. Somehow they think being tolerant of that is ecumenical, when actually it's murderous. So I would like to do today is to go back to these three persons, Confucius, Buddha, and Jesus, and not summarize their life, but have their life from a legendary point of view and a mythical point of view touch our lives anew today. And it may seem that we're simply going back into some esoteric point in history, but what we're really trying to touch is what does it mean to be a human being and what does it mean to be fully alive? And what does it mean to live in the world that you're not the only person in it? 
Now, I don't know about you, but I have a very, very difficult time with that. I can't drive in, ca in traffic. I can't do my job. I can't meet another person without somehow or another thinking it's always about me and the fundamental relationship I have with another person. As a matter of fact, sometimes I meet people in my life who threaten me. And they threaten me because of their excellence. They threaten me because of their integrity. And I start fighting with them in my head. Let me ask you this question. Has everything you expected in life worked out? <laughs> and if it hasn't, do you take it personally? Now the first person up today is Confucius. Believe it or not, Confucius never achieved what he wanted to achieve. I find that remarkable. When we look at what Confucius achieved, spiritually, psychologically, socially, he's someone to be admired. But if you paid attention to himself, he had this terrible feeling that he would never amount to anything and had the feeling that he never achieved what he wanted to achieve in life, which was to be a major head of state. He was always a low level government bureaucrat. <laughs> See, we never think of these people as having real jobs. We never even think of these people as having real lives. We never even think of these people as having ambition. I always love people who write books to say, let your ego go, but write the check to me. <laughs> I am going to carry on a seminar as to what it means to transcend the I. And after the talk, oh, that is the greatest thing we ever heard. And then you said, oh, you can't help but have a sense of purpose and meaning because you've been affirmed. Confucius had the courage to take the ego and not eliminate it because if you've ever tried to eliminate it, you know how well it marries you. It moves in and it takes over. It wants you to spend your whole life trying to get rid of it. <laughs> That's how you keep it. But once you say to your ego, welcome, it doesn't know what to do. It's never been welcomed anywhere before. It's either had to be repented, manhandled, turned upside down, eliminated, ignored, or denied, as opposed to welcome. And once that happened, Confucius could begin to say things like this. He is the inventor, if you will, as far as we know, of that statement we call the golden rule. Do to others what you would have them do to you, or do not do to others what you would have them not do to you. Talk about seizing the self. You can't have a golden rule without you. You can't have a golden rule without yourself. You can't have a golden rule without another person. I know the current fad is, let's get rid of ourselves and become cosmic. <laughs> Meanwhile, the cosmos has spent eternity trying to create you. <laughs> the next time you look up in the sky, take it personally and say, thank you. You made me. Everything has to be where it is for you to be here right now. What does it mean for me to possess this self? What does it mean for me to be possessed by this self? Confucius also had this wonderful meditation because the essence of Confucianism is not some kind of religious magic but a deep perception. The self is like a pebble that you toss into a lake and it ripples in concentric circles to the edge. Whether you're a boulder or a pebble, 
when you hit the waters of life, you reverberate for eternity. We're now beginning to think that every word we speak, every thought we have, every deed we perform, changes, blesses, or hurts the cosmos. If we're the children of the cosmos, then anything that is, everything that can be seen and unseen, is touched by every thought, word, and deed. Let's take all the love that's in this room and release it. Why do I hear the stars rejoicing? Why is the sun shining brighter? Why is it the moon is impatient to bless the night? Our second person up, the Buddha, which is not his name. His name is Siddhartha. Do you know how it is sometimes in religious circles? We always have to start with the negative, the mundane, and the failed. Many of the churches I go to, this is how they start a service on Sunday morning. Let's call to mind our sins. Why? <laughs> I can't get them out of my head. <laughs> it's as if you've forgotten that you said something you shouldn't have said. It's as if you've forgotten that you thought something you shouldn't be thinking. It's as if you forgot that you did something you shouldn't have done. I would love to have it. Let's come together and remind ourselves of who we are, our potential, and a potential, and hold ourselves accountable to our potential. I can bless with my words. I can change the word with my thoughts. I can bless another person with my deeds. I can release all the love that's in my heart to the world at any given point within my life. Let's come together and call to mind who we are and what we can be and how we can change the face of the earth right here, right now. Or shall I lament about what everybody else doesn't do and what I didn't do? Hmm. Or shall I enter into the moment called here, the place called now, the moment called now, or the place called here, and the person called me? Shall I do that in the here and now of my life? and possess myself profoundly? Here's the interesting thing about the Buddha. Not a name, not even a title, but a realization. Buddha means one who is awake, one who is enlightened, one who entered into the depth of the self and found that the self and everything existed dynamically connected. He even said to his disciples who said to him, how do you want to be remembered? And he said, as one who is awake. You're looking at someone who doesn't wake up till 12 o'clock and then prepares to go to sleep. I'm forever resting. I have to take a nap before I take a nap. What does it mean to be awake? What does it mean to be alert? Here's the fascinating thing about the Buddha. He had all the money he could have or need. He had all the status. He had all the power. He wanted for nothing. He also came from a nice family, a loving father, a kind mother, and he himself was a good man. Well, he certainly can't be a religious figure. There's nothing wrong with him. <laughs> Mythologically, the Buddha is perfect. There's only one problem. He hasn't met the real world. See, here's the difference between being in touch with yourself and in love with your ego. When you're in love with your ego, you spend eternity trying to do something for yourself. 
when you're centered in yourself, you become aware there's somebody else. And one fine day, the Buddha climbs a wall. Well, one fine day, the Buddha goes out through the gate. Well, one fine day, the Buddha goes into the greater world and he sees the sick, the dying, and the dead. And his life is destroyed. Suddenly, power means nothing. Suddenly, wealth means nothing. Suddenly, status means nothing. How can this be? He not only allows, but invites the world around him to break his heart, to destroy his wealth, to annihilate his status, to turn his power inside out. The Buddha now talks about things like detachment, letting go, letting it be, and discovers the power of compassion. When you can cry over another person's plight, that's not your weakness. When you have fear of another person's endangerment, that's not limitation. You have done the greatest thing a human being can do, care about someone or something other than yourself. We need to weep over what we do to the water. We need to cry over what we do to the air. We need to be broken hearted about what we do to the children. We need to be outraged by the fences and the walls and the nastiness and the meanness that we entertain as we separate one person from another. enter into the depth of the self for the Buddha to become compassionate to all beings, to the earth, to a rock, to a plant, to an animal, to a child, to one another, to the self. And while Buddhist system can invent all kinds of rules of life. The only thing that matters is this lovely little story I would like to share with you from the Buddhist tradition. Two monks were walking from one community to another. And as they were walking along and keeping the silence, day one, day two, Day three, they came to a woman who at the end of a mud pond, she was beautifully dressed and she started to cry. Oh, woe is me. I have no one to take me to the other side of the mud puddle. One monk picked her up, <laughs> carried her over the mud puddle, put her down. And the two monks began their journey anew. And three days later, one monk said to the monk who picked up the woman, it's against the rule to touch a woman. And the monk who carried the woman over the mud puddle said, I put her down three days ago. Are you still carrying her? <laughs> <laughs> if you meet somebody screaming in need, what do you say? I'm too holy, I'm too religious, I'm centering myself in the universe. The cosmos is a personal witness to what you do in the here and now. The expanse of it all doesn't make here and now irrelevant. The expanse of it all is the canvas that makes the here and now stand out like the stars in the night and the sun in the day. No rule is greater than the rule of compassion, to meet the need of the other for the sake of the other. 
third person I would like to share with you today, Jesus. Jesus has been rewritten by theologians, spiritual writers, philosophers, and poets so many times that he no longer knows who he is. <laughs> the great creed of the Christian church says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Right out of the Gospel of John, how profound is that? But the biography of Jesus, or the autobiography of Jesus is, he's a peasant Jew from Galilee, from a nowhere place called Nazareth. He has nothing going for him. He comes from parents who are a little off the wall. <laughs> they have visions of angels. <laughs> they find out something about their child from heaven. Yeah, right. <laughs> Heavenly children are always born in Nazareth. <laughs> Heavenly children are always born in a pit of destruction. Heavenly children always end up on death row. Yeah, just ask any one of us today. Many of the great religious leaders in the United States have more money than you can dream of. That's the scandal. And fund organizations in the world that destroy the environment and destroy other people. That needs to be confronted. And that is precisely what this Jew from Nazareth did, who had no rights, no privilege, no dignity. The only thing Jesus had going for him was that he was loved by God. And is that enough? When is the last day I had a good day because I said I was loved by God? I want to know whether you love me. I want to know whether you love me. I want to know whether you accept me, and I want to know whether you pay me. <laughs> when was the last time I was happier than the day is long because I thought God loved me? Jesus has this rather strange idea that no matter how bad life is, if God loves you, you can be God on earth in the here and now of life, even if you're hanging on the cross. In the last moments of his life, he makes a best friend out of a thief and says to his executioner, forgive you. Really? You mean you want to forgive when it's convenient? You want to forgive when it makes sense? You want to love when the outcome is measurable? You want to give it to yourself when it's beneficial? No wonder he keeps on rising. He keeps on rising in the oppressed, the hated, and the discarded of the world. He even made this remarkable statement. I was hungry, he gave me to eat. I was thirsty, he gave me to drink. I was naked and you clothed me, a stranger and you welcomed me. Sick and you comforted me in prison and you visited me. Oh, said Jesus, when you did it to the least, she did it to me. True disciples of Jesus are not those who have membership cards. True disciples of Jesus are like that pebble that Confucius threw into the lake. And their love reverberates forever, especially toward those that the powers to be hate and fear and scorn. It's like the Buddha, no greater love. that practices the power of compassion in everything we say, think, and do. 
So the next time you think you're nobody, the next time you think you've never achieved a thing, the next time you hit the brick wall of rejection, the next time life invites you to look down, look up. The next time life invites you to look down, look within. And there you will hear the cosmos say, I love you. I created you. I cherish you. And all the universe will be witnessing that thought by which another person is blessed, that word by which another person is held sacred, that embrace by which another person is lifted up. Thank you, blessed community. Thank you, my friends, for having the courage to be who you are, that the universe may be who she is. Be at peace.